Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Chapter 21 The discussion of Mr. Collins' offer was now nearly at an end, and Elizabeth had only to suffer from the uncomfortable feelings necessarily attending it, and occasionally from some peevish illusion of her mother. As for the gentleman himself, his feelings were chiefly expressed, not by embarrassment or dejection, or by trying to avoid her, but by stiffness of manner and resentful silence. He scarcely ever spoke to her, and the assiduous attentions which he had been so sensible of himself were transferred for the rest of the day to Miss Lucas, whose civility in listening to him was a seasonable relief to them all, and especially to her friend. The morrow produced no abatement of Mrs. Bennet's ill-humour or ill-health. Mr. Collins was also in the same state of angry pride. Elizabeth had hoped that his resentment might shorten his visit, but his plan did not appear in the least affected by it. He was always to have gone on Saturday, and to Saturday he still meant to stay. After breakfast the girls walked to Meryton to inquire if Mr. Wickham were returned, and to lament over his absence from the Netherfield Ball. He joined them on their entering the town, and attended them to their aunts, where his regret and vexation, and the concern of everybody, were well talked over. To Elizabeth, however, he voluntarily acknowledged that the necessity of his absence had been self-imposed. "'I found,' said he, as the time drew near, "'that I had better not meet Mr. Darcy, "'that to be in the same room, the same party with him, "'for so many hours together, might be more than I could bear, "'and that scenes might arise unpleasant to more than myself.' "'She highly approved his forbearance, "'and they had leisure for a full discussion of it, and for all the commendation which they civilly bestowed on each other, as Wickham and another officer walked back with them to Longbourn, and during the walk he particularly attended to her. His accompanying them was a double advantage. She felt all the compliment it offered to herself, and it was most acceptable as an occasion of introducing him to her father and mother. Soon after their return a letter was delivered to Miss Bennet. It came from Netherfield, and was opened immediately. The envelope contained a sheet of elegant little hot-pressed paper, well covered with a lady's fair, flowing hand. And Elizabeth saw her sister's countenance change as she read it, and saw her dwelling intently on some particular passages. Jane recollected herself soon and putting the letter away, tried to join with her usual cheerfulness in the general conversation. But Elizabeth felt an anxiety on the subject which drew off her attention even from Wickham. And no sooner had he and his companion taken leave than a glance from Jane invited her to follow her upstairs. When they had gained their own room, Jane, taking out her letter, said, this is from Caroline Bingley. What it contains has surprised me a good deal. The whole party have left Netherfield by this time, and are on their way to town, and without any intention of coming back again. You shall hear what she says. She then read the first sentence aloud, which comprised the information of their having just resolved to follow their brother to town directly, and of their meaning to dine that day in Grosvenor Street, where Mr. Hurst had a house. The next was in these words. I do not pretend to regret anything I shall leave in Hertfordshire, except your society, my dearest friend. But we will hope, at some future period, to enjoy many returns of that delightful intercourse we have known, and in the meanwhile may lessen the pain of separation by a very frequent and most unreserved correspondence. I depend on you for that. 
To these high-flown expressions, Elizabeth listened with all the insensibility of distrust, and though the suddenness of their removal surprised her, she saw nothing in it really to lament. It was not to be supposed that their absence from Netherfield would prevent Mr. Bingley's being there, and as to the loss of their society, she was persuaded that Jane must soon cease to regard it in the enjoyment of his. "'It is unlucky,' said she, after a short pause, "'that you should not be able to see your friends before they leave the country. But may we not hope that the period of future happiness, to which Miss Bingley looks forward, may arrive earlier than she is aware?' and that the delightful intercourse you have known as friends will be renewed with yet greater satisfaction as sisters? Mr. Bingley will not be detained in London by them. Caroline decidedly says that none of the party will return into Hertfordshire this winter. I will read it to you. When my brother left us yesterday, he imagined that the business which took him to London might be concluded in three or four days. But as we are certain it cannot be so, and at the same time convinced that when Charles gets to town he will be in no hurry to leave it again, we have determined on following him thither, that he may not be obliged to spend his vacant hours in a comfortless hotel. Many of my acquaintance are already there for the winter. I wish I could hear that you, my dearest friend, had any intention of making one in the crowd but of that I despair. I sincerely hope your Christmas in Hertfordshire may abound in the gaieties which that season generally brings, and that your bow will be so numerous as to prevent your feeling the loss of the three of whom we shall deprive you. It is evident by this, added Jane, that he comes back no more this winter. It is only evident that Miss Bingley does not mean he should. Why will you think so? It must be his own doing. He is his own master. But you do not know all. I will read you the passage which particularly hurts me. I will have no reserves from you. Mr. Darcy is impatient to see his sister, and to confess the truth. We are scarcely less eager to meet her again. I really do not think Georgiana Darcy has her equal for beauty, elegance, and accomplishments, and the affection she inspires in Louisa and myself is heightened into something still more interesting, from the hope we dare to entertain of her being hereafter our sister. I do not know whether I ever before mentioned to you my feelings on this subject but I will not leave the country without confiding them, and I trust you will not esteem them unreasonable. My brother greatly admires her already. He will have frequent opportunity now of seeing her on the most intimate footing. Her relations all wish the connection as much as his own, and a sister's partiality is not misleading me, I think, when I call Charles most capable of engaging any woman's heart. With all these circumstances to favour an attachment, and nothing to prevent it, am I wrong, my dearest Jane, in indulging the hope of an event which will secure the happiness of so many? What think you of this sentence, my dear Lizzie? said Jane, as she finished it. Is it not clear enough? Does it not expressly declare that Caroline neither expects nor wishes me to be her sister? that she is perfectly convinced of her brother's indifference, and that if she suspects the nature of my feelings for him, she means, most kindly, to put me on my guard. Can there be any other opinion on the subject? Yes, there can, for mine is totally different. Will you hear it? Most willingly. You shall have it in a few words. Miss Bingley sees that her brother is in love with you, and wants him to marry Miss Darcy. She follows him to town in the hope of keeping him there, and tries to persuade you that he does not care about you." Jane shook her head. "'Indeed, Jane, you ought to believe me. 
"'No one who has ever seen you together can doubt his affection. "'Miss Bingley, I am sure, cannot. "'She is not such a simpleton. "'Could she have seen half as much love in Mr. Darcy for herself, "'she would have ordered her wedding clothes. "'But the case is this. "'We are not rich enough or grand enough for them, "'and she is the more anxious to get Miss Darcy for her brother "'from the notion that when there has been one intermarriage,' she may have less trouble in achieving a second, in which there is certainly some ingenuity, and I dare say it would succeed if Mr. Berg were out of the way. But, my dearest Jane, you cannot seriously imagine that because Miss Bingley tells you her brother greatly admires Miss Darcy, he is in the smallest degree less sensible of your merit than when he took leave of you on Tuesday, or that it would be in her power to persuade him that instead of being in love with you, he is very much in love with her friend. "'If we thought alike of Miss Bingley,' replied Jane, "'your representation of all this might make me quite easy. But I know the foundation is unjust. Caroline is incapable of willfully deceiving any one, and all that I can hope for in this case is that she is deceived herself.' "'That is right. You could not have stated a more happy idea, since you will not take comfort in mine. Believe her to be deceived by all means. You have now done your duty by her, and must fret no longer.' "'But, my dearest sister, can I be happy, even supposing the best, in accepting a man whose sisters and friends are all wishing him to marry elsewhere?' "'You must decide for yourself,' said Elizabeth. "'And if, upon mature deliberation, "'you find that the misery of disobliging his two sisters "'is more than equivalent to the happiness of being his wife, "'I advise you by all means to refuse him.' "'How can you talk so?' said Jane, faintly smiling. "'You must know that though I should be exceedingly grieved at their disapprobation, I could not hesitate. I did not think you would, and that being the case, I cannot consider your situation with much compassion. But if he returns no more this winter, my choice will never be required. A thousand things may arise in six months. The idea of his returning no more Elizabeth treated with the utmost contempt. It appeared to her merely the suggestion of Caroline's interested wishes, and she could not for a moment suppose that those wishes, however openly or artfully spoken, could influence a young man so totally independent of every one. She represented to her sister as forcibly as possible what she felt on the subject, and had soon the pleasure of seeing its happy effect. Jane's temper was not desponding and she was gradually led to hope, though the diffidence of affection sometimes overcame the hope, that Bingley would return to Netherfield and answer every wish of her heart. They agreed that Mrs. Bennet should only hear of the departure of the family, without being alarmed on the score of the gentleman's conduct. But even this partial communication gave her a great deal of concern, and she bewailed it as exceedingly unlucky that the ladies should happen to go away, just as they were all getting so intimate together. After lamenting it, however, at some length, she had the consolation of thinking Mr. Bingley would be soon down again, and soon dining at Longbourn. And the conclusion of all was the comfortable declaration that though he had been invited only to a family dinner, she would take care to have two full courses. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 The Bennets were engaged to dine with the Lucases, and again during the chief of the day was Miss Lucas so kind as to listen to Mr. Collins. Elizabeth took an opportunity of thanking her. "'It keeps him in good humour, said she, "'and I am more obliged to you than I can express.' Charlotte assured her friend of her satisfaction in being useful, and that it amply repaid her for the little sacrifice of her time. 
This was very amiable, but Charlotte's kindness extended farther than Elizabeth had any conception of. Its object was nothing less than to secure her from any return of Mr. Collins' addresses by engaging them towards herself. Such was Miss Lucas's scheme, and appearances were so favourable that when they parted at night she would have felt almost sure of success if he had not been leaving Hertfordshire so very soon. But here she did an injustice to the fire and independence of his character, for it led him to escape out of Longbourn House the next morning with admirable slyness, and hasten to Lucas Lodge to throw himself at her feet. He was anxious to avoid the notice of his cousins, from a conviction that if they saw him depart they could not fail to conjecture his design, and he was not willing to have the attempt known till its success could be known likewise. For though feeling almost secure, and with reason, for Charlotte had been tolerably encouraging, he was comparatively diffident since the adventure of Wednesday. His reception, however, was of the most flattering kind. Miss Lucas perceived him from an upper window as he walked towards the house, and instantly set out to meet him accidentally in the lane. But little had she dared to hope that so much love and eloquence awaited her there. In as short a time as Mr. Collins's long speeches would allow, everything was settled between them to the satisfaction of both, and as they entered the house he earnestly entreated her to name the day that was to make him the happiest of men. And though such a solicitation must be waived for the present, the lady felt no inclination to trifle with his happiness. The stupidity with which he was favoured by nature must guard his courtship from any charm that could make a woman wish for its continuance. And Miss Lucas, who accepted him solely from the pure and disinterested desire of an establishment, cared not how soon that establishment were gained. Sir William and Lady Lucas were speedily applied to for their consent, and it was bestowed with a most joyful alacrity. Mr. Collins' present circumstances made it a most eligible match for their daughter, to whom they could give little fortune, and his prospects of future wealth were exceedingly fair. Lady Lucas began directly to calculate, with more interest than the matter had ever excited before, how many years longer Mr. Bennet was likely to live. And Sir William gave it as his decided opinion that whenever Mr. Collins should be in possession of the Longbourn estate, it would be highly expedient that both he and his wife should make their appearance at St. James. The whole family, in short, were properly overjoyed on the occasion. The younger girls formed hopes of coming out a year or two sooner than they might otherwise have done, and the boys were relieved from their apprehension of Charlotte's dying an old maid. Charlotte herself was tolerably composed. She had gained her point, and had time to consider of it. Her reflections were in general satisfactory. Mr. Collins, to be sure, was neither sensible nor agreeable. His society was irksome, and his attachment to her must be imaginary. But still, he would be her husband. Without thinking highly either of men or matrimony, marriage had always been her object. It was the only honourable provision for well-educated young women of small fortune and however uncertain of giving happiness, must be their pleasantest preservative from want. This preservative she had now obtained, and at the age of twenty-seven, without having ever been handsome, she felt all the good luck of it. The least agreeable circumstance in the business was the surprise it must occasion to Elizabeth Bennet, whose friendship she valued beyond that of any other person. Elizabeth would wonder, and probably would blame her. And though her resolution was not to be shaken, her feelings must be hurt by such disapprobation. She resolved to give her the information herself, and therefore charged Mr. Collins 
when he returned to Longbourn to dinner, to drop no hint of what had passed before any of the family. A promise of secrecy was, of course, very dutifully given, but it could not be kept without difficulty, for the curiosity excited by his long absence burst forth in such very direct questions on his return as required some ingenuity to evade, and he was at the same time exercising great self-denial, for he was longing to publish his prosperous love. As he was to begin his journey too early on the morrow to see any of the family, the ceremony of leave-taking was performed when the ladies moved for the night, and Mrs. Bennet, with great politeness and cordiality, said how happy they should be to see him at Longbourn again, whenever his other engagements might allow him to visit them. "'My dear madam,' he replied, this invitation is particularly gratifying, because it is what I have been hoping to receive, and you may be very certain that I shall avail myself of it as soon as possible. They were all astonished, and Mr. Bennet, who could by no means wish for so speedy a return, immediately said, "'But is there not danger of Lady Catherine's disapprobation here, my good sir?' "'You had better neglect your relations than run the risk of offending your patroness.' "'My dear sir,' replied Mr. Collins, "'I am particularly obliged to you for this friendly caution, "'and you may depend upon my not taking so material a step "'without her ladyship's concurrence. "'You cannot be too much on your guard. "'Risk anything rather than her displeasure.' and if you find it likely to be raised by your coming to us again, which I should think exceedingly probable, stay quietly at home, and be satisfied that we shall take no offence. Believe me, my dear sir, my gratitude is warmly excited by such affectionate attention, and, depend upon it, you will speedily receive from me a letter of thanks for this as well as for every other mark of your regard during my stay in Hertfordshire. As for my fair cousins, though my absence may not be long enough to render it necessary, I shall take the liberty of wishing them health and happiness, not excepting my cousin Elizabeth. With proper civilities the ladies then withdrew, all of them equally surprised to find that he meditated a quick return. Mrs. Bennet wished to understand by it that he thought of paying his addresses to one of her younger girls, and Mary might have been prevailed on to accept him. She rated his abilities much higher than any of the others. There was a solidity in his reflections which often struck her, and though by no means so clever as herself, she thought that if encouraged to read and improve himself by such an example as hers, he might become a very agreeable companion. But on the following morning every hope of this kind was done away. Miss Lucas called soon after breakfast, and in a private conference with Elizabeth related the event of the day before. The possibility of Mr. Collins fancying himself in love with her friend had once occurred to Elizabeth within the last day or two, but that Charlotte could encourage him seemed almost as far from possibility as that she could encourage him herself, and her astonishment was consequently so great as to overcome at first the bounds of decorum, and she could not help crying out, "'Engaged to Mr. Collins? My dear Charlotte! Impossible!' The steady countenance which Miss Lucas had commanded in telling her story gave way to a momentary confusion here, on receiving so direct a reproach, though, as it was no more than she expected, she soon regained her composure, and calmly replied, "'Why should you be surprised, my dear Eliza? Do you think it incredible that Mr. Collins should be able to procure any woman's good opinion because he was not so happy as to succeed with you?' But Elizabeth had now recollected herself, 
and making a strong effort for it, was able to assure her with tolerable firmness that the prospect of their relationship was highly grateful to her, and that she wished her all imaginable happiness. "'I see what you are feeling,' replied Charlotte. "'You must be surprised, very much surprised, so lately as Mr. Collins was wishing to marry you. But when you have time to think it all over, I hope you will be satisfied with what I have done. I am not romantic, you know. I never was. I ask only a comfortable home. And considering Mr. Collins' character, connections, and situation in life, I am convinced that my chance of happiness with him is as fair as most people can boast on entering the marriage state. Elizabeth quietly answered, Undoubtedly. And after an awkward pause, they returned to the rest of the family. Charlotte did not stay much longer, and Elizabeth was then left to reflect on what she had heard. It was a long time before she became at all reconciled to the idea of so unsuitable a match. The strangeness of Mr. Collins making two offers of marriage within three days was nothing in comparison of his being now accepted. She had always felt that Charlotte's opinion of matrimony was not exactly like her own. But she could not have supposed it possible that when called into action she would have sacrificed every better feeling to worldly advantage. Charlotte, the wife of Mr. Collins, was a most humiliating picture, and to the pang of a friend disgracing herself and sunk in her esteem was added the distressing conviction that it was impossible for that friend to be tolerably happy in the lot she had chosen. End of chapter 22